You know, every time I present here and have to follow uh, Diane and the Vanettes <laughs> or Rick and Karen, I just want to say what they said and then go back and sit down and have a good time. But I agreed to do more than that, so. <clears throat> Should have done this before, but <clears throat> obviously I did not. But I forgive myself. <clears throat> But gravity doesn't. <laughs> okay. Um, actually, when I was asked to speak here this week, um, I wasn't sure what I wanted to talk about um, because although it, they had a theme for me, it was right before the shootings in Texas, right after the shootings in Buffalo, and right before the ones that <clears throat> happened after that, and <clears throat> and I was. You know, I'm taken aback, and, and some of you may be as well. And I, and I just wanted to acknowledge that. There's a lot of pain in our country right now. And <clears throat> one of the things they teach us when we're very young, we all learn it in grade school, it's how to hide our pain. Um, you know, the kid's out in the playground, somebody says, how are you? And they say, fine, how are you? Fine, how are you? Fine. And some kid tells the story of a bad home life. And you can see everybody kind of step back from that person, and everybody gets the message. What should you be saying when I ask you, how are you? fine, because <clears throat> if you're not fine, and then you hear all these other people say fine, because they got the message too, um, they know there's a risk to telling people that we're not fine. And so a lot of people are in pain for a lot of reasons and don't share it with others. And, and that can be okay, because some people need that time to reset themselves and move forward. And so I was thinking about all that, and then I went back in and looked at the outline for the, for the uh, theme this week, and I thought, you know, the most useful thing we can do is start with ourselves. There's uh, an old saying, I'm sure you've all heard it, uh, if you have peace in the family, there's peace in the home. Peace in the home means peace in the village. Peace in the village means peace in the nation. Peace in the nation means peace in the world. And so it all starts with ourselves. So the body is the one thing in this world which is completely and intimately ours. You know, we're the only ones who really know what our body is experiencing. We think we know what other people's are, but we have to extrapolate, imagine from our own experience. And as it was pointed out in the uh, outline, our bodies are magnificent and magical conduits between God and our individual consciousness. It's, it's a way of God expressing itself. And our body is a wonderful way to do that for certain experiences. I, I don't know why the creator, animator of the universe does everything, but I have a hint on why things might be and, and how they work. And so in a physical universe created by one source to have this experiences of learning that can only be happening in a physical world, need a physical body. And so our bodies ought to be celebrated for the way they allow us to experience the world in which we live. So there's only one body, and that's spirit's body. And our body is a reflection of an individualized idea of that. And all bodies are good bodies. Not that we've all been taught to think that about ourselves. Has anybody ever criticized their body? <laughs> if not allowed, at least to yourself. Yet they offer a direct and clear path to the divine experience. And there's going to be different bodies, just like there are different types of trees. You wouldn't look at a willow tree and say, that would have made a better fern. No, you're going to appreciate it for that. Or, um, you know, breeds of dogs. You know, you, you, when you see dog shows, you know, they don't say, gee, I wish the German shepherds were a little more curly haired. You know, you Judge, but they do things that other dogs can't do, and all the other dogs do too. So we see that all around us, and yet we, we put these constraints on ourselves like there's only one way to be. And so most of us have likely grown up with social messaging that our bodies are not acceptable the way they are. And, and this is for the guys out there. Women get that message in our culture way more than guys do. We get that message. Um, and, but we get other messages that we're supposed to feel shame about. And it turns out in every culture, shame is gender-specific and culture-specific. Like, if you're a woman, raise your hand when you were really brokenhearted that you didn't get picked for the football team. 
or when the 19-year-old in the fourth grade came over and attempted to rearrange your teeth and didn't ask permission. But as a guy, we learn to feel shame about that, but women learn to feel shame about well, you get billboards all over the place. And so whatever the fashion of the day is, because actually Miss America of 1924 wouldn't have made the cut in 1958, and the one in 1958 would be looked at as overweight in 1978, and then, you know, it just goes on from there. And so women now, if you look at TV shows like Alias and other things, not only are women supposed to look young forever, and, uh, but they have to be able to kick your ass too, because they've all studied Kung Fu, right? <laughs> That's a lot of demands. Okay, so for one reason or another, we get these messages that our bodies are, well, if you're like me and Judy, too tall, or, or, or as I like to call sensibly sized, sensibly sized people, but the rest of everybody else is too tall, too short, too fat, too black, too white, too brown, too something else, and we all suffer from the twos, right? And so we may have an ideal image of how we, our body could look when we tell our body that it's not acceptable right now that's not a very good mod um, um, message because it's been determined now that every cell in our body is listening to every word we think and following the instructions. So if we could learn to love our bodies as they are, we can open ourselves up to an opportunity to heal these wounds. Problem is, as Holmes has told us many times, most of our, well, I'll back off for a second. We live in an ocean of thought. And for simplicity's sake, let's say that the mind is divided into you know, a couple of different parts. One is the one that chooses what to do. The other is the thing that actually does it. Now, it's all one, and, you know, just for simplicity. And so it just follows these instructions. So if it's getting instructions that you're defective in some way and translate that into shame and feeling bad, well, we all know what bad people deserve. What do bad people deserve? Nothing except a little punishment, right? and maybe a lot of guilt. And if we're guilty, boy, then we really deserve... Anybody get that experience in life? Anybody? Am I the only one who got those messages that, you know, maybe I wasn't, uh, I wasn't um, fully acceptable, let's put it that way. Sometimes I'll make jokes, and, I'll, and some people will act like, why do you say that? And I feel like, oh, boy, fifth grade all over again. <laughs> inappropriate, inappropriate. But <laughs> Anybody else had that experience, Rick? <laughs> or Clark, wherever you are. Okay, so this part of us that actually creates things is responsive to all of our thoughts. It doesn't get to choose what thoughts to have, it just follows orders. It's, you know, like when, when you um, type something into Google or DuckDuckGo, if you're smart, uh, and you, know, you, want to, you write in um, more abundance and you misspelled it and it thinks you're going to a barn dance. Well, it doesn't correct that for you, it just takes you to the barn dance, right? So, I mean, that will out. Well, think of it that way. So every cell in our body is listening. In fact, there's a book out there, our book for the, the month is, I hadn't realized it was a book for the month when I chose it, but there's a psychiatrist out of Boston, and I, I forget whether he's from Boston University or, or Harvard. I'm, I am familiar with his work. And his book is The Body Keeps the Score. And so when we tell ourselves our bodies is defective based on the fashion of the day, 1924, 1958, today, all those cells are listening. And so, you know, whatever your embodiment is of what you're supposed to be isn't probably that precise. You're supposed to be the way you are. And anyways, our, our bodies are wonderful, magnificent things, and they provide us with all kinds of great experiences. There's taste. There's colors, there's shapes, there's forms, there's sensations, there's all this good stuff. Uh, legs are really good. It's like, if I don't like what you're telling me, I could get mad or I could say, hey, I got legs, I don't have to hear this. Anybody do that or you tend to get sucked into the, you know, legs are good. You can get away. You don't have to listen to this if you don't want to, but there's guards at the door, so don't leave. <laughs> well, not really. Not in case somebody's here for the first time. See, I'm being punished already. <laughs> Well, inappropriate, that's what it was. Okay. Okay, so pain that we don't really acknowledge and don't push away, and a lot of our thoughts are unconscious, as Holmes has said that a lot. We don't always know what our thoughts are, um, but when we start to uncover them, we can make changes. But 
know, so instead of beating ourselves up for doing this to ourselves, oh, there I go again, beating, you know, calling myself names or hating myself, how bad I am. That'll fix it, right? <laughs> I've, I really saw this in action one time. Um, I had a client, and I never, never talk about clients unless they give me permission, but then I disguise them so you'd never know who this person is. But, but I just don't want you to, to think I'm just randomly exposing people's lives. I had a client that uh, she was sent to me um, because she had a mysterious illness. It was likely Epstein-Barr disease that some of you may have, may have heard of. Just one of those mysterious ailments that stays with people for a long time. And as I got to know her, I found that she got to do a lot of her work from home. And what she really liked about that was that she got to spend more time with her family. Um, now her job was, she was one of those people with very high clearances and security stuff, and was involved in um, each day or every few days revising uh, the navigation codes to send nuclear weapons to major cities in the world and, and kill everybody there. Well, that's you know, I mean, that's what they do, right? They don't they don't say, well, that's a good person, that's a bad person. We'll just kill them all, right? And so they really and and but this is a very smart woman, and. I remember one time I was on a, a ski lift and I was beside an electrical engineer from Stanford. And he was, he was involved in medical studies, but he said, for electrical engineers, one of the most intriguing problems is solving how to get an object from point A to point B. And he said, the problem is most engineers don't study any humanities or social sciences courses, so it never occurs to them to wonder what does it mean for the people at point B when they solve that problem. Well, it means a lot, they're gone. And so she'd figured that out already, and it caught, you know, so she was in conflict with herself. She really loved her job, and she really loved her family, and she knew if her job was ever implemented, her family would be gone. And so her body, at least it seemed to me, and we had conversations about that, and she started to think about it herself, and she felt that was what was going on. And she was starting to improve, but then she left because she didn't want to leave her job because she liked the other stuff about it. And so I don't know what happened later on. But, you know, when I had that uh, experience about 35 years ago, I thought, wow, that's really, you know, it, it really made sense to me. And I, I'd done a lot of study on that. We just know a lot more about it now than I did 35 years ago. But it was a really nice example. It was so clear, it just jumped out at me, you know, when we were, when we were talking. So, um, the pain that people don't want to talk about oftentimes gets stuck in the body. Um, and if it gets stuck in a part of the brain that doesn't have access to the part of the brain that can resolve it, then it just keeps coming up and repeating it. Every time that memory is brought out and remembered, it sets off that same sense of doom and, and awfulness. Now, there are treatments for that, too. I bring that up because um, there are actually good treatments if you... If you know anybody who's had trauma like that, uh, the best treatment I would recommend is EMDR. So find somebody who does EMDR, you can all look it up. It's been proven to be effective uh, in some studies with as high as 77% with combat victims. So you know, ought to be able to handle Because you know, we all have things that were major in our life, but we're okay. I mean, okay, maybe not okay, but we can, we've resolved it, it doesn't bother us anymore. Anybody got those things? And then there's something else, maybe happened back in the sixth grade or the eighth grade or the second grade, that's not that big a deal, but yet still, when you think of it, it gives a, a, a wince or a feeling of embarrassment. Anybody got those? Well, why did the big one get healed and not this one? Well, apparently, if the brain's process of resolving the uh, trauma doesn't complete, it just gets stuck there. And then it, a lot of times, if it's severe enough, it will actually get stuck in the nervous system too, so that when people remember it, they feel the sounds and the sights and the smells, and you know, that's post-traumatic stress. And if you can, with EMDR, you can sort of kickstart that part of the brain that got interrupted. And in the, most cases, you can resolve it in less than 10 sessions, and, and I've you know, had them resolve less than that. So again, that's just a useful thing to do because I like to offer some practical advice if you know, if you know anybody who's in those situations. Um, how many people were criticized by anybody for wearing a mask during COVID? Did anybody get criticized by anybody? Okay, well, 
I think that it's safe to say it's not anti-spiritual to tend to the needs of the body, including the use of medications. In fact, as Ernest Holmes reminded us, since we cannot walk on water, we take a boat or an aspirin. And to me, this includes wearing clothes when I'm cold, wearing shoes when I need to protect my feet, and wearing a mask when I think I'm not going to feel comfortable in a situation where I feel I might be vulnerable. So if I beat myself up for being bad, if not being able to defend my body without aid, that's not going to support my ability to feel healthy. That's just going to support my ability to feel defective and, and wrong. Does that make sense? And, and so I like that idea. I can't walk on water. I'll take a boat. So um, I asked this earlier, but again, have you ever compared your body to another body and thought it should, your body should be something other than it is? Anybody ever had that? Some people tell me that happens as they get, dare I say, older? <laughs> But why should that be true? Rather than compare it to another or to disparage it, what if we each loved our body for being the unique and wonderful thing that it is? And what can we do about that? Well, consider this. There is a universal intelligence that fills and permeates the entire universe. An ocean of mind, as I mentioned, that, and we're submerged inside and outside. And this creative power that I mentioned is always operating, and it responds to our predominant beliefs. Not so much our hopes, but our beliefs. There's a saying in, uh, I think, corporate America that that which is believed gets done, everything else is just lip service. Does that make sense? I mean, how many times people in corporations will hear this team, team, rah, rah, we're going to do all this stuff today and everybody rolls their eyes because they know what really goes on around there, right? What, what gets believed gets done. Everything else is just lip service. So to understand this, I would invite you to consider that there is both conscious intelligence and unconscious intelligence. Like, for instance, the molecules that make up this table here, this device, um, they never fall, they never, I mean, they know to keep this. I don't know how they do it, but there is an intelligence because if everything in the universe is really made out of the same things in different arrangements, I mean, there's only, you know, so many things that have been identified. And, you know, if you take H2O, you get water. If you take H, maybe one H or three H or there and add O, you get something else. But it's always whatever it is, and then it knows how to hold together. That's unconscious intelligence. Conscious intelligence is where you actually have volition and can decide if you want to keep on doing that. I don't think this table has any real thought as to whether or not it should hold this, this, this or not. It's just subject to the physical laws, and it does it. But we are blessed to be self-conscious expressions of the one. And over time, as we've evolved and become more aware of that, that puts us at choice. And that's a good thing, too, because if everything in your life that's going wrong, if I was to tell you, hey, I found out why it's happening, it's the Martians. Well, that'd be bad news, because I don't even know how to find the Martians, let alone how, how to get them to stop, right? But if I'm doing it myself, now that's the only person in the world I can really control, right? And the only body I can control is my own. And I am the only thinker in my own mind. So... Imagine again, for simplicity, that this is in, there's this invisible to us, not invisible, but invisible to us and, and our senses, uh, an unlimited power that can create anything, but it's unable to choose what to create. It just follows the instructions of the unconscious or conscious mind. And then it only becomes conscious when we pay attention and notice it. I'll give you an example. Anybody here ever driven to the store in a vehicle that you're not accustomed to driving, like your spouse or your partner's car. Anybody ever done that? Like you're, you know, they got a black car, you got a red car. And you come out of the market and you're looking for your, your black car and you walk right by the red one wondering, where the, where's my, hey dude, where's my car? <laughs> and, and it's totally invisible to you because that wasn't in your expectation. So we, 
In many ways, we also Photoshop in, especially in our peripheral vision. The brain Photoshops in what we expect to see based on experience, because that's how our ancestors uh, survived about 50,000 years ago when the brain was developing, was scanning around looking for danger. And anything that remotely reminded them of danger, then the brain would automatically look for pattern recognition. And then the lion, who's not even there, becomes more important than things that really are there because you only have to forget the lion once to be in pretty big trouble. Well, we evolved to the same brain. So, you know, maybe we may think we're paying attention, but we're often not. Um, so once we learn to pay attention, um, then we can start putting more attention maybe on thinking about our hopes instead of our fears. And with enough repetition, a hope can actually become a belief. Because that's how all our beliefs happen. They started off, some time they weren't a belief. They were just an observation that may or may not have been true that you then decided was what the whole world was about. Somebody betrayed me once when I was 14 and I can never forgive anybody again. Or trust anybody, you know what I'm talking about? You know, what's that saying? Uh, once burned, twice shy. Mm, how about just once burned, next time a little more careful. <laughs> can still trust, just maybe a little more careful. Um, and when I talk about invisible forces, we have lots of experience in believing in and accepting and responding to invisible forces. Uh, anybody here got a fob on your car chain that when you push the button, it locks your car from distance? Now, when we're walking away from the car, not even looking at it, and beep, we fully expect that that car locked, right? Now, if, we, if, if your car beeps and you don't hear the beep, you go, did I leave the trunk open? But most of the time, we just click it and just walk away. Right now in this room, there is, depending on the time and the time zone, there's possibly a basketball game going on. There could be a hockey game going on. There are literally trillions of dollars floating through the air in here. And if you had the proper code on your computer and you know, that money shows up, it's, it goes through the ether, it's, you know, we're not surprised. If I had a television set that could tune to the right frequency of where these, these pictures are going and things like that and the sound, then I could, I could hear them, right? But my senses weren't designed for that. But they do exist, right? So we believe in these automatic things. I, I pointed out to my neighbor one time, well, more than once, but... When they open their, car, their garage door from a distance, I point out, if you did that 250 years ago, you'd have been burned as a witch. <laughs> right? So it's not really that hard to, to stretch it out that there are other invisible forces that are at work for us. And so, um, as Holmes reminded us, most of our thoughts are unconscious. And uh, if they're believed, our body's going to take note and if we believe we're somehow bad, undeserving, then our body says, here you got it. Your wish is my command, automatic response. You know, this, this is your order. You want poached eggs, coffee for breakfast. Oh yeah, and somebody to take away your self-esteem. Your wish is my command. <laughs> so I, I ask people all the time, pay attention to your self-talk. Like right now, you're having a conversation with yourself that I can't hear. You're agreeing with me or unfortunately, a few of you may be disagreeing with me entirely, or you're wondering, why are they talking so fast or so much? <laughs> or I, he said that a couple of months ago. I don't want to hear that again. Or you may be having a memory. All kinds of things are going on, but you can agree you have conversations with yourself, right? And then there's the you that's watching you have that conversation with yourself, and then there's the you that's judging whether it's good or bad, or right? So ask yourself just this. Are, are your self-talk, your inner conversation, supporting your hope, supporting your hopes, or your fears. Because a lot of times we find out it's our fears, and then but we don't investigate them whether those fears are valid, because then we're, we're caught in the uh, biological grip of anxiety and fear and doubt and hoping everybody notices, and how are you? I'm fine. <laughs> and, and don't really pay attention to how to get out of that so much as, yikes, I hope nobody sees it. Anybody ever have those experiences? Or, just me, huh? Thanks. <laughs> well, I'm having one right now. <laughs> okay, so the solution is, this is some, recognize there's something we can do about that. You know, if you don't like what you're thinking, and you're not okay with the results of that thinking, then you better think of something else. And how many thinkers do you have in your own mind that you know about? <laughs> 
we're the only thinkers in our own mind, so we're the ones who can choose to have a different thought. And if you do that on a consistent basis, those thoughts can become hopes, and those hopes can become beliefs. And when those beliefs become beliefs, that automatic part of the brain moves into action and life gets better. So um, if you're willing to do a brief closed eye exercise, I invite you all to close your eyes. And, and uh, if you're worried about your purse, Rick will keep a good eye on it. In fact, he might even go through it to make sure nothing's missing. Okay, so sit quietly and think about parts of your body that you're happy about. Like, you know, you may have criticized it, but would you rather have your legs or not? Quick answer. <laughs> and those legs can get you away from anybody you don't want to hear. Not that you wouldn't want to hear this, but if that ever comes up in your life, you could actually get up and walk away. That's good. And um, you can paddle with, way, with legs if you have a paddle board like Mary. Or you can take a walk in the woods. Um, you can enjoy scenery with your eyes. Um, arms and hands are good because you can bring food to your mouth. And that brings in other good things. And so while you're sitting there, uh, one of the things I've learned to do when I hear an irritating or unpleasant noise, like somebody parking, uh, stopping at the, beside my car and revving, revving their Harley Davidson engine louder than I want to hear it, or people with loud pipes, or a neighbor screaming at somebody, I remind myself the reason that bothers me is because I can hear. And that changes the whole picture, wouldn't it? Things, if, I, if, it, if I'm in pain somewhere, that means my body's able to tell me that if I keep walking on that, it might break. I should take a moment and examine that for a moment and see what's going on. So whatever you choose, just simply appreciate that whole experience. And if you really put your attention on it and really appreciate just how magnificent whatever parts you're appreciating are, that could be even termed love. And love invites more of whatever you're putting its attention on. In this case, it's something good. And love dissolves anything not like itself. So love can resolve your conflicts by embracing it. And so, paying more attention to what you'd love to have more of in your life clears your path and paves the way for that to show up. So, living every day in wonder and appreciating our bodies is a real practical experience. Namaste. <laughs>